Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is nuclear mishaps. In the last lecture, we looked at the possibility of accidental nuclear war. Those would be situations where two states would fire nuclear weapons against each other, despite the fact that no one actually wanted to initiate a conflict. Here we're looking at something a little bit similar, but also different. Instead of having a war against one another, we're going to be looking at situations where a state might commit an own goal, so to speak, and create a nuclear explosion on itself. There are three particularly scary cases that the United States faced, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Let's get to it. First up is the 1961 Goldsboro B-52 incident. You remember the B-52. This was the common plane that the United States would use as a bomber during the Cold War. On January 23rd, 1961, one of these B-52s took off from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina. As was standard, the plane was equipped with two thermonuclear weapons. After flying around for a bit, they noticed a fuel leak. The leak just got worse and worse, and so the decision was made to bail. Three ended up dying, whereas five safely ejected. The plane itself broke apart with its thermonuclear weapons still on board. The bulk of the wreckage landed about 12 miles outside of Goldsboro, hence the name of the incident. One of the bombs had its parachute deploy, and it ended up landing in a tree. Three of its four arming mechanisms self-activated. Had the fourth also activated, the bomb could have exploded. At full force, these weapons have a four megaton yield. Goldsboro itself is relatively unpopulated, but if you take that sort of explosion and you put it over the White House, this is the extent of the damage to Washington, D.C. It's enormous. Fortunately, these weapons contain a half measure of safety. Recall that thermonuclear bombs consist of two stages, a primary stage on the left and a secondary stage on the right. In the primary stage, a red conventional explosive causes the yellow plutonium pit to condense. This generates a fission reaction, which creates a lot of heat. That heat causes the deuterium and tritium in the black core to fuse together to create helium and extra neutrons. Those extra neutrons exacerbate the fission reaction going on around it. And the entire point of that primary stage is just to ignite the secondary stage, where there is a lot of deuterium and tritium waiting to fuse together. When they fuse together, they create more neutrons, and those neutrons feed a fission reaction going on in the secondary stage as well. Now, for that safety measure, the secondary stage does not have the tritium pre-installed. As a part of the arming sequence, the tritium gets pushed into the secondary stage. Thus, even if the bomb had gone off, it would not have created the full thermonuclear explosion. There still would have been a nuclear explosion because the primary stage is a nuclear device but it would not have gone to the level of a 4 megaton explosion like I just illustrated. Instead, you would just have a boosted fission bomb. Of course, a boosted fission bomb placed in the wrong location, like directly over the White House, still destroys an immense area and would kill a whole lot of people. The fate of the second bomb is also interesting. Unlike the first, its parachute did not deploy. It just fell to the ground partially breaking up in the process. But this created a separate set of problems. Fortunately, the conventional explosive did not go off. But that meant that there was a plutonium pit just sitting out there somewhere nearby Goldsboro, North Carolina. And as you will recall, the central barrier to developing nuclear weapons is possessing either enriched uranium or reprocessed plutonium. Having plutonium out there available to someone else was something that the U.S. government did not want. They had to find the plutonium pit. They eventually succeeded, but it took some effort. As that plutonium pit fell to the ground, it drilled itself deep in a hole. What's interesting, though, is that they only extracted the plutonium pit. They left the secondary stage behind. Now, before you rush out to Goldsboro, North Carolina, to get yourself at secondary stage of a nuclear weapon, 
Keep in mind a couple of things. First, it's still buried under about a couple hundred feet of dirt. And second, even if you were to recover it, you still don't really have a functioning bomb. The secondary stage of a thermonuclear weapon needs a traditional nuclear explosion to explode itself. So all you would really have is a bunch of radioactive material, which I guess is interesting and somewhat dangerous, but it's not as inherently dangerous as a fully functioning nuclear weapon. The next incident is the 1966 Palomares crash. Once again, our offending aircraft was the B-52 bomber. This was a part of Operation Chrome Dome. You'll remember that this was a part of the Cold War where the United States was flying non-stop missions up north, over to Alaska, and over to Europe to keep many bombers in the air at all times so that they could be closer to the Soviet Union to drop nuclear weapons on a shorter notice. Like any good bomber in Operation Chrome Dome, this particular B-52 in question carried four Mark 28 thermonuclear weapons. The plane was on the European flight path of Chrome Dome. But trouble arose as the plane approached Palomares in Spain. Because that flight path is exceptionally long, the B-52 cannot do it by itself. It needs mid-air refueling. To do that, the Air Force uses a KC-135, the plane on the left. However, during the refueling, the KC-135 ignited, causing it to explode. The B-52 broke apart in the wake of that explosion, killing three aboard, with the remaining four successfully ejecting. One of the bombs was found intact, but two of them had their conventional explosives go off. This is good in the sense that we're not having a nuclear detonation, but it's bad in the sense that essentially we have a dirty bomb. If you have the conventional explosive go off, then you're causing all of the radioactive material within the weapon to disperse. It's not creating a nuclear explosion, but it is making radiation go everywhere. This creates an arduous cleanup process. The United States essentially had to take the topsoil from the area, put it into the barrels that you see here, and cart it away. The fourth bomb was the biggest issue. No one really knew where it went. As a result, they had to bring in an underwater search team. The timeline here is kind of crazy. The accident itself took place on January 17th. A full two months later, on March 17th, Alvin, the ship you see there, finds it. But as they're trying to recover the weapon, the Alvin drops it. And it wasn't until April 2nd that the Alvin found it once more. Finally, on April 7th, they got it out of the water. Mission accomplished. Last up is the 1968 Thule crash. And what do you know? Our good friend the B-52 is making a third appearance. This is once again a part of Operation Chrome Dome. But there's a twist here. There's an early alert station in Thule, Greenland. Because of Greenland's proximity to the Soviet Union, it is likely that a bombing run from the Soviet Union would come over that particular area. Thus, the United States liked to keep eyes on the station to make sure that the station itself wasn't the target of a Soviet attack. To get eyes on Thule, our good friend the B-52 took off from an airfield in Plattsburgh, New York, heading toward Greenland. Like the other Chrome Dome operations, it would just fly north, stay there for a while, fly around a bit, and then return home. But of course, like any other self-respecting member of Operation Chrome Dome, this B-52 was carrying four nuclear weapons. As it approached Thule, a fire broke out aboard. Six of the seven on board ejected. Those that did were eventually all safely recovered. The seventh, however, died. The plane itself crashed into North Star Bay, about 7.5 miles from Thule. Fortunately, none of the nuclear weapons went off. But had this been over a population center, and had those nuclear weapons armed themselves, well, this is the damage that would have been done by a 1.1 megaton explosion. The conventional explosives did trigger, however, creating the same sort of dirty bomb scenario as the previous incident. The crash site itself was something else. 
On the left is the point of impact, and you can see the indentations in the ice as a result of all of the pressure. The black streak on the right is what happened to the ice as a consequence of all of the jet fuel burning. Getting all the way out there was a challenge, and in fact, the only way they could do it at first was via sled. Eventually, they set up a camp and got to work. But this wasn't easy. The plane crash happened in the Northern Hemisphere's winter months. And as a consequence, because this is the Arctic Circle, there was no daylight to operate with. But all of the radioactive materials lying on the ground required attention. And there was concern that if the summer months were to come around before cleanup was over, the ice would melt and the radioactive contaminants would scatter all over the place. As a result, they spent a lot of time collecting ice and shipping it away from the site. So what's the central takeaway here? Well, I guess the obvious one is that if you're flying nuclear-armed B-52s around the clock, eventually you're going to have multiple disasters. And indeed, after the Thule incident, Operation Chrome Dome was retired. Perhaps the deeper takeaway is that there is no such thing as a safe nuclear weapon, only safer nuclear weapons. Maybe the United States got lucky in these three cases. They only had to worry about dirty bombs going off, not a full-scale thermonuclear explosion over their own population centers. Either way, if you're a country thinking about developing nuclear weapons, you need to take this into account. There's not just financial costs of developing a nuclear bomb you also have to project the potential risk associated to yourself by possessing a nuclear weapon. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.